colonizationist and um, anti-slavery people had, and these are good people. I mean, they're trying to fight evil, um, and they're in a different time and a different culture, so we can't judge them too much because we see things so differently. But um, we can look at them and say, uh, you know, you were racist. Um, and we can look at the abolitionists and say, some of your ideas were racist and stuff. So I don't want to disparage them, and I don't want to disparage the other people I'm going to talk about. But the American Colonization Society, they had these, these three sort of primary tenets and ideas in regard to ending slavery. The first was they wanted to abolish slavery, um, but they didn't want to do it like overnight because they didn't want to bankrupt the South and the North because the economics of the country and cotton production, exports and imports, um, the plantations in the southern states were very important to the economy, and if you were to emancipate the slaves, uh, you would have a slow in that uh, <laughs> very much. You'd have to pay your slaves as uh, laborers, and this would, you know, you wouldn't be able to be the guy in the plantation with the big house and all this kind of stuff. And, there's a lot of reason they didn't want to do it overnight. They wanted to come up with schemes that would be incremental enough to allow culture to sort of catch up with um, abolition. Um, so if slaveholders would gradually emancipate their slaves and free them upon their deaths, um, such as George Washington wanted to free his slaves on his death, and then his, his wife kept them around, you know, and stuff like that. But they had these ideas about how you would go about abolishing slavery in a way that wouldn't sort of wreck the country. So they were incrementalists. Um, they were also, they believed in um, compensation. So the slaveholders slave would be getting a financial loss if they uh, emancipated the slaves. And, and along with compensation, they had colonization, the American Colonization Society. And the idea was that we wanted to emancipate the slaves, set up colonies in Liberia or Sierra Leone and in Africa and various places, and free the slaves but deport them back to their country. Because um, slavery was wrong, because they were humans, and it was, you know, rapacious and wicked and all that kind of stuff. But we also didn't want those other people here, because we didn't want them sleeping with our daughters and, you know, producing mulatto children and all these reasons that they had because they were racist and, um, you know, America's destiny was, was as a white European nation kind of thing. The last idea that they had with uh, compensation and colonization and incrementalism was amelioration and mission work. <clears throat> and the idea was that we need to send missionaries to the South to sort of teach slaves to read the word of God. We need to get slaves the gospel and set up churches for them and um, also instruct the slaveholders to be nicer. So we're going to compensate the slaveholders and we're going to, um, you know, sort of make a way for them to transition from owning a man as a chattel to having laborers on your force. So these were the reigning ideas. There were abolitionists during this period, but kind of the reigning church-approved, society-approved ideas in the largest anti-slavery organizations in the country up through the 1830s, from, you know, like 1780s to 1830s, were these ideas. In the 1830s, after, you know, um, 40 or so years of fighting slavery with these ideas, um, some of the people within the anti-slavery societies kind of came out of them and made a declaration of sentiments and turned all those ideas on their heads. So they were for the immediate, total, unconditional emancipation of the slaves. They were not for emancipating them when they turned, say, 29 or emancipating their children, or setting up sort of like a time scale that they would be emancipated and it would happen in such a way that um, the economy wouldn't be affected. They were prepared and saying crazy things like they would let the union be torn asunder 
um, in order to free the slaves. Um, by the 1850s, and so these were the immediatists, and they are known today, historians kind of consider them the abolitionists because they were for the abolition, they cried abolition, so they were new abolitionists, slightly different from the um, evangelicals in Britain. But they started calling for immediate, total, unconditional emancipation. They weren't for amelioration, and they were for freeing slaves who were Americans and letting them be free among us, okay? And uh, they were opposed because they were going to be causing riots, and black people and white people were going to be, like, having babies, and it was just, they were really, really bad. And the principal people opposing these abolitionists who rose up after 40 years were... Um, slaveholders. Slaveholders didn't like them. But the colonizationists didn't like them. And um, the abolitionists would call them things like regulationists. And the abolitionists weren't nice all the time. You know, William Lloyd Garrison, you know, I'll be harsh as truth, you know, that um, quote that I should memorize because I always bring it up. And then, and then it. Um, they were not known for being, you know, silver tongued and and sweet people, and they were highly critical of colonization, compensation, amelioration, because they thought slaveholders were man-stealers and murderers, according to the Bible. That there may be some biblical form of slavery and some prescriptions about how you would do that, but the Bible condemned stealing a man from a country and turning him into a beast. So they said man was, uh, that the slave was a man and a brother. He was created in the image of God, and because of the incarnation of Christ, he was redeemed just the same. And so they went around and they called slavery sin. And they, whenever the, um, the slaveholders would accuse them of trying to cause riots and trying to destroy the economy and all this kind of stuff, and they would say, you're trying to let all these people loose and they're going to be sleeping with our daughters and all this kind of stuff, the abolitionists, they would retort back things like, no, actually you guys are sleeping with the slaves and you're producing the mulattoes and call them out on the connection between slavery and rape. They actually led with it sometime. Um, last night in our meeting, I'm not going to read, most, a lot of you were there, but Elijah Lovejoy was, you know, killed, killed for a number of things, but the, uh, some of the last things that he was printing in his newspaper were revealing the fact that um, the South was full of people raping slaves. Not everyone, not everyone. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin and showed that there were good slave owners, but sometimes if they got into debt, they might have to sell Tom down the river, and he might be beaten to death, but he had a good master. So there were, there were different ways of bringing up these evils. But Elijah Lovejoy, whenever he was blamed for um, these things, he decided to turn around. After they had thrown his press in the Mississippi for the third time, the next thing he printed was, you know, denunciation of the South as it was a brothel. And Wendell Phillips called the South a brothel. And William Lloyd Garrison said that our country was full of rapists and thieves. And the abolitionists did not use... Uh, euphemisms, and they did not seek to end sin gradually. They said, I had sin, God showed it to me, the moment I saw it, I repented, and I stopped doing it. I cut it off. Go and sin no more. And they said, the nation must do the same thing. As they said these things, I know it's back in the day when they're all Christians, as they said these things, the people in their culture and their time who were anti-slavery looked at them and said things like, no, you can't do it overnight. This is, go look at the history. You can't do it overnight. You'll destroy the economy. Anti-slavery said, well, we don't want to rip apart the Union, the North and the South, over slavery. So let's focus on keeping slavery out of the territories that we've received from Mexico. So they were for the sort of defunding of slavery and keeping it from expanding. They were for the um, 
Well, it's, it's tan do you guys know about the Mexico City policy? They don't want to pay for abortions in Mexico, you know, that sort of thing. They were for stopping slavery where it had not yet gone and had resolved to sort of say, we know we can't stop it in the South. And they had plans for like abolishing it by like 1998 and stuff like that. But um, they probably were motivated by good sentiment and loved the slave as a man and a brother as well. But when these abolitionists rose up and started calling for immediatism, they were called foolish and they were told to be more pragmatic. I am not making this stuff up. <coughs> they were told to not call it sin. When they were told not to call it sin, they said, fine, we'll call it the epitome of sin. <laughs> they went into churches and they exhorted them to rise up and um, fight against it. And um, to churches said things like, um, we agree with you, but um, our, our role and our job is to sort of preach the gospel, and sh the Great Commission or whatever. Um, and then the abolitionists left that church and then they had a colonization meeting and then they passed around a plate and they sent the anti-slavery societies that were for colonization and not immediatism money. But the abolitionists did not care. They weren't actually trying to attack the anti-slavery people. They were attacking the ideas. In the process of attacking, attacking the ideas are the propositions of colonization, not the people. The people looking at their own ideas did not do as Don Cooper did which, that wasn't a bruise, I didn't know he was going to do that, but they did not do that sort of, I was wrong, I should do this. They did not do that. They fought the abolitionists. So the abolitionists were fighting against slavery, and they were fighting against colonizationists at the same time. Does that sound familiar? I don't think I'm imposing this historical record on this um, talk. Grant, that wasn't the talk you wanted me to give, is it? All right. No, explain why you gave that talk. I'm about to give a different talk. Um, I think, I don't know if I have this reputation in this room, but the reputation of sort of like being critical of the pro-life movement and pointing out things that we shouldn't point out and so on and so forth. Well, we wanted to have this rape exception um, conference. Um, We have no idea why my computer is choosing to do what it's doing. So, <coughs> bear with me. I wasn't going to give this talk. Those are the notes from it. Do not read them. <laughs> um, let me see if it'll just work this time. Does anyone know how to do anything about this? And you guys be okay with the fact that it's going to look bad? We're going to get one second. I'll, I'll just filibuster. But I, I am not. I mean, I'll apologize. Sometimes I and Grant and Todd especially and Toby more than most um, are harsh as truth. And they, are, they say things that I think are jolting, and so on and so forth. And sometimes we are critical of ideas. Now, rebuke me if I am critical of a person and unjustly sort of like attacking them and not their ideas. But permit me to talk about the ideas held by persons. Um, I'm, I'm going to use names of people who do good things in the pro-life movement who I do not hate in any way, but I'm, I'm opposed to the ideas that they are pushing. It doesn't have to be cool.
He sings, he dances, he grows a beard. And he, he's a techno wizard. Okay, promote redemption, not destruction. There's this, I haven't done the research for this and really tried to figure out all the statistical stuff, but um, I'm going to go back over real quick, um, you know, the final point. The rape exception is the one thing the pro-choicers need. I'm just kind of convinced of that. It's not because I hate pro-lifers that have rape exceptions or I didn't vote for Romney. It, that's, that's not why this slide exists. I am convinced, as someone who gazes at my navel, that the rape exception is, if not the one, it's a key thing. Like I said earlier, it opened the door for maybe accept, um, you know, acceptance. Um, as, is, as was um, pointed out to me, you know, and uh, is very true, and I've seen this, and it's documented, it's in a lot of number of good books. A lot of the churches were kind of like, yeah, in the case of rape, I can see it. Long before Roe v. Wade, all over, lots of denominations, Protestant denominations. Um, and sort of allowing abortion in the case of rape, I think, in the way it was used in court battles and in cultural appeals, um, sort of normalized abortion because we had to have it around to help women like Anna because um, it would be bad for Anna to have all those slides that made all you people cry. You know, we had to help her out, you know. So we, we, we imposed what we could do on her as though she did not have the strength. And um, got it legal. And then the next thing was that the rape exception is the one thing that pro-lifers tend to give them. So this is the most important thing when you're arguing with a pro-abort. They will say, what about rape? That's like their linchpin. Because it's hard to turn and say back to them, well, she should just have that baby. Because it's not easy. And it sounds callous, you know? And we can get callous by talking about it so much. So because they know that, and it's kind of a catch-22, you know, forcing a woman to raise a child, um, or, you know, it's, it actually, you know the violinist argument of Tom Thompson? Like, you wake up in the morning and there's a violinist attached to you, and you're like, oh, can you unplug him? Have you all heard that argument? It used to be kind of in vogue, but I think, like, Frank Beckwith has, like, balled it up and caught it on fire and thrown it in the Mississippi. Um, uh, it used to be a popular argument, but that was the idea. But it only ever applied to the rape exception. No, you know, most people who have conceived ch children are choosing something, so we could always argue back, well, she chose to have sex, so therefore she has, you know, she has this responsibility. Well, actually, she didn't choose to have sex. She was manipulated, attacked, something like that. So it's very difficult, and because it was difficult, and because we chose to, we were trying to save the babies and um, the, one, the ones that we could, I think we didn't develop, and I, and I wasn't a part of this, you know, I was like probably like playing basketball or something. Well, actually, I wasn't even alive, but we didn't develop, as in um, people who are opposed to abortion, did not develop sort of a sophisticated um, thesis of promoting the gospel and like using this rape tragedy as the cross that we would carry into this, this den. We just didn't do it, and we gave it to him. I'm being too long-winded. We learned a couple of things today, I think, um, sort of. I mean, we can, I can add these, 11 and 12, that abortion protects rapists and <coughs> protects pedophiles. And beginning tomorrow, I mean, we've run some of this stuff on AHA, but beginning tomorrow and until abortion is over, we are going to take this concept and this idea that abortion protects pedophiles and just shove it down the culture's throat, all right? Because the thing is, is it's actually true. And um, so, as I was saying earlier, like the, the serial date rapist knows that he's never gonna have to be a dad because he lives in a culture that, you know, kills two children every minute of every day, every day of the year. And so, knowing that, and knowing that abortion is always there to protect him, he can come on the AHA page at 2 in the morning and tell us that, you know, we're, you know, sexist. Because he's protecting abortion, which is protecting him and his lifestyle, 
with pedophiles, we saw very clearly that a 13-year-old girl who's scared and believing her father figure, you know, will take the pills she's given. Why did he do that? He was protecting himself. Abortion protects pedophiles. It protects rapists. Here's our position. Tentative, we'll have to change some of it maybe. Christ calls us to care for the weak and unwanted, not abandon them to destruction. We are to help the helpless, provide for the fatherless, and restore the oppressed and preyed upon. Our world is infested with rape and murder. The proper response to these evils is not to encourage or increase them. The rapists and pedophiles plaguing our culture are encouraged and protected by the accepted practice and approval of abortion. They know that abortion can be used to cover up their crime and absolve them from responsibility. Children conceived in rape and incest deserve our protection and adoption. They ought to be cherished and loved for who they are, not destroyed for how they got here. They are image bearers of God and have purpose and meaning in life. We cannot abandon a single one of them to destruction. Answering rape with abortion is adding evil to evil, violence to violence, and death to psychological destruction. Destroying a baby never helps a mommy. It's a modern myth that constructed by women who have freely chosen to abort their non-rape conceived babies. They feel so bad about their abortions, they have com commandeered the so-called rape exception as a justification for their use of abortion as birth control. Countless women who have chosen to keep their rape conceived babies testify to the fact that they found healing from the attack in loving their child. They answered hate with love and evil with good. As a culture, we should be brave like these women and promote redemption not destruction. We put all this in a quad fold. I don't know if y'all have seen these. these. These are made for the church. We've got a graphic image inside and a, and a call to care for the least and not be a Pharisee who passes by on the other side of the road. This material has all been put into a quad fold with some of the slides, some of the posters that y'all have seen a million times. And um, we, we wanted to have them here today to give to you for free, but now we're going to charge you because that's what AHA is really about, making money. So, um, so we're going to have to send them to you through the store. But we are going to be like the abolitionist, take these ideas and let them reign all over the culture. You're at Walmart and you're buying a 24-pack of Bud or whatever, and you take it home and you open it up and there's one of these folded up inside there. Ruin your day, but people are going to start thinking abortion protects pedophiles. The drop cards and everything, we're going to inundate it. We're not going to give them a choice about these things. We will not achieve abolition through compromise. Stop abandoning children conceived in rape. The rape exception hasn't worked. Abolish human abortion. This is an abolitionist poster. If I had time, I would remake it to say, we will not achieve abolition without compromise. We got to abandon some children conceived in rape on the way to saving other children who are the vast majority of children who are not conceived in rape. The rape exception will work. Give it a chance. Regulate human abortion. Legislate human abortion. Incrementally eradicate human abortion. Um, those ideas may be better ideas than the crazy person saying immediate and unconditional total abolition of abortion. There's not even a mechanism, you know? Just calling for repentance. Repentance in the church, repentance in the streets, calling to see them as children and repentance of sin. That, that incrementalist strategy may be better. I think it's faithless and unbiblical, and I've made those arguments elsewhere, and so we're not doing it, and... There's a point to this little line here at the bottom. Incrementalism actually hasn't worked. Candidates who promise to um, 
save uh, the 99 while abandoning the 1 have never saved the 99. If Mitt Romney won, it's safe to say that he would do exactly what he said he would do and pass no legislation um, regulating abortion anyway. He just put the rape exception in there in his commercials, which he ran in swing states, which are pretty much impossible to find on, online now, that he did approve of the use of abortion in the case of rape and that those who were worried about voting for him because of abortion platform of the GOP didn't have to worry. He was giving them what they, what they needed. Um, our position, the position of abolition, is uh, what I read. And here is the only difference between all those yellow words that I read between us and pro-lifers. I'm going to say this is going to sound a little mean and judgmental. It's not the difference between us and all pro-lifers, um, or maybe even a majority, but some of them and those of them who have power. This is, this is the difference. Everything I read, they agree with. Killing children conceived in rape is wrong. But the culture's not there with us. The culture's with us maybe on these other things. They agree with all the material. They agree that we ought to be promoting redemption, not disruption, caring for the least of these, all this kind of stuff. The difference between pro-lifers and... the slide's not coming up. I'm about to take it as providence. <coughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> I'm a The difference between pro-lifers and abolitionists isn't really exactly in the contact, con, um, in what we say when it's not a political season. I shared the rape and abortion are wrong for the same reason early in 2012. I didn't get a date on this screenshot, but you can look at the likes. 18646, and I think her likes are at 33 or something like that now. Abby Johnson, who has done good work, rape and abortion are wrong for the same reason. They're both violent acts of aggression upon other people's bodies. So true. Affirming it, saying not just like similar things, the exact same thing. That's the slide that disappeared, and I put it back. Students for Life um, they also shared our poster and they passed it out on campuses. Rape and abortion are wrong for the same reasons. Both are violent acts of aggression upon other bodies. I didn't make this poster. It actually looks better than the other one. The only difference between this one and that one is this one doesn't have an AHA symbol on it. But they reshared the same thing. Students for Life and Abby Johnson. The difference is that whereas we said rape and abortion are wrong for the same reason, they are both violent acts of aggression upon other people's bodies. We said that in early 2012. We also said that in late 2012. When many, not all, pro-lifers who had said it said I am an abortion abolitionist there's a different story on why they, they did that um, and I did not waste my vote I voted for Romney this was in response to a video I made saying hey 
You know, it seems a little crazy, but every time a presidential candidate comes up and he has a rape exception, we vote for him. And when we do that, we educate the GOP. We tell the GOP, if you give us people who will support violent acts of aggression on other people's bodies, we will vote for them and we will call them pro-life. Every time they do that, from far, as far back as you can look, um, they testify and they tell the GOP, if you run this guy, if he's more evil than the next guy, we will vote for him. So no matter what you give us, <coughs> less evil. Well, it depends on whether you think that children are created in the image of God and that attacking the image of God is something that you can do for political expedience. No, there's not a difference. Romney was a pro-choicer, and he was running against a pro-abort. And the pro-life movement, who had said that rape and abortion are wrong for the same reason, when it came down to it, said... Um, that they would not throw away their vote. We were saying crazy things like, we would. And it was really hard to understand. And there were a couple of reasons. One, there is the principle of, I don't want to, like what Don was kind of, you know, apologizing for. Even if it's strategically stupid, I, and it's morally superior purist or whatever, I don't feel comfortable saying, um, you know, this guy who is running television commercials saying, hey, don't worry, if you get raped, we'll let you abort it. Vote for me. I don't feel comfortable signing my name on the dotted line for that guy, knowing people like Anna and Judah and countless other people. I don't feel comfortable. This is a personal thing. Um, but it, 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 there is this idea of principle. I'm not going to be unprincipled, and I'm not going to abandon people to destruction. They're the least of these, and I don't want to stand before uh, my Lord and say, um, I, I did not stand up for the least or the weak or the hard ones. I stood up, and I fought for the ones who were easy to protect, but I did not fight for the ones who were hard to protect. So that was one thing. The other thing is, is we had a strategy in mind, and we wanted to, thinking that Obama was going to win, and thinking that the pro-lifers were all going to vote for Romney and call him pro-life because we saw him do it with McCain and, you know, Bush and Bush and Dole. And, um, I almost said Reagan in there. <laughs> that would have been bad. But we didn't, um, we, we didn't just kind of be like, we're morally superior and we're principled and we're the best and you guys are all a bunch of hypocrites. Look at us. Oh, you know, we didn't do that. Um, we, we had a reason. Because we have this seven-stage strategy, and we have this hope for 2015, and here's what we're thinking. We said these principled things, and the pro-life movement came, and they attacked us, and they said we were foolish, and they were stupid, and that, you know, we would have blood on our hands. If I had $100 for everyone who told me that I had blood on my hands, that I was a baby killer, and that they hoped that I died, and all this kind of stuff for making these videos, um, we would buy this building um, and fix it. And, um, but this is what we were being told over and over and over and over. And um, people said it was because we were arrogant and that we were trying to be purists, so on and so forth. But what we were trying to do was tell people in the pro-life movement we will not compromise. Because in early 2012, we ran posters that said, no compromise with abortion. I think they're hanging on the walls in there. And all the pro-lifers liked them. Like, 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 797 likes on no compromise with abortion. Um, and they liked that, and they said it themselves. So we'd say, no compromise with abortion. And then Stan Trues would be like, uh, you shouldn't compromise with abortion. Um, like the next day, and, and so everyone would repeat these things and adopt them and stand by them. The difference was that when we said no compromise, it wasn't a poster to get likes. It was the statement of a position that we were going to hold on to, even if the world said, you are foolish and wouldn't stand with us. So when we stood up and said, well, 
we will not compromise. I'm an abolitionist. The title of Garrison's manifesto was No Compromise with Slavery. And the thesis was, how did slavery become so entrenched and unbeatable through compromise? How will slavery be abolished through an uncompromising position? We were going to stand up and state an uncompromising position. We were going to state it from the point of view of a couple of bearded men or women and, um, in Norman and, and send it out there and the pro-life movement would kind of smash back. But when they did that, like Terrence Daughtery, do y'all know Terrence? Abolitionist Society of North Carolina. Unliker of AHA, anti-AHA. We were stupid. We should have voted for Romney. We were some kind of, my favorite rumor about us ever, Ron Paul Colt. Yeah, y'all, didn't, y'all maybe weren't here. Terrence Daughtery, who is now thinking, ah, maybe an uncompromising position. The numbers of people who were standing in the pro-life movement, Ryan Bouse, who was getting arrested for obstructing the sidewalk in front of the White House with a bunch of pro-lifers, uh, now an abolitionist, uncompromising. It wasn't good for us. We didn't sell a lot of t-shirts, and a lot of people think we're silly and stupid and that we should have bent. But we were being abolitionists, and we were saying no compromise. What they did is they said, no, 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 no. We're, we're abortion abolitionists. And then they went and equated the term abolitionist with, I will not throw away my vote, which was hilarious, because abolitionists are famous for throwing away their votes. I'm not going to get into it. Um, And I'm not going to talk about it. LifeSite News did it too and all that kind of stuff. Um, Judah Judah Myers invented this poster, by the way. Yeah, she did it forever, okay? I I, I just want to publicly publicly connect that. Um, I don't invent anything new. I just harvest. Um, and, and put it into Helvetica and Gill Sands, sometimes condensed bold. Um, well, that's not Helvetica. The so-called rape exception is the key to keeping abortion legal and the chief rhetorical tactic of the pro-choicer. It is also the one thing that pro-lifers have been most prepared to give to them. The reason that we would go after the pro-lifers, reveal their inconsistency, show their compromise, call them to be uncompromising, is because, one, we are convinced that this is a key thing that we give over to them. And until we take it and modify it, abortion will remain legal and thinkable. Um, other, other people did it. And um, to sort of conclude this and to explain why it is that I would get up here and give an impromptu talk, um, I want to, I don't know if this is going on the internet, but when we did that, it's not because I dislike any of the people on the slides. I disdain their ideas because I think their ideas, sorry I'm saying it this way, are protecting the destruction of preborn human beings created in the image of God in the one place that they're able to live and the one place that our Lord chose as the entrance to this world. I don't think that I ever want to vote pro-life first because that means you can vote for violent acts of aggression upon other people's bodies. Can I put up the picture of sharing the picture and saying so true and then supporting it? We're not morally superior or purist. We are just people, as abolitionists, who will not support the ideas that we normally oppose. We don't oppose an idea in, you know, March, and then support that idea and educate the culture to believe it's okay in January. And I'm not going to talk about it.
I'm not going to talk about that either. <laughs> so in conclusion, if you signed up for, to be an abolitionist, um, you did sign up to be an abolitionist. It is not a fancy word. It's not a rhetorical synonym. And it's not some kind of word that we're using because it looks good on t-shirts or anything like that. It actually has a meaning, and we are sticking to it. No compromise with abortion. An uncompromising spirit against abortion, the sin of abortion, will be the key to bringing it to an end. Compromise not only shouldn't work biblically, it has not worked. There has been no fruit. There's been fruit in saving babies. Many babies have been saved. There's been good pro-life work. There has not been fruit towards abolition. We are trying to build that. And while we build it, like the abolitionists before us, we will be attacked for our positions. But we're nice people. That's it. All right. So there's the door. <laughs> Choose you this day. You can be a halfway abolitionist. Just know that we're sending Tim to you. Uh, I could take questions, but you might grill me and I might look bad. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. So, that you claim everybody has and people aren't, aren't doing it. So yeah, that's a good question. It's actually a good question because it leads me to something I forgot. And from what little bit I've heard, mm -hmm. apparently there's people who think you're doing exactly the same thing everybody else has done so far. So what is the difference if, that you're doing? If, um, here, here, the last... As an example, I'll try to give an example. If in the last political election, every single pro-lifer, every single person who called themselves a pro-lifer or an anti-abortionist of any kind, leaders, organizations, all the way down, people, every single one of them, like 650,000 of them, or however many pro-lifers that are active, if every single one of them said exactly what we said, and held to it, that would have yielded these results. Obama would have won the election. And the GOP would have said, holy crap, we lost the pro-life movement. Not a single pro-lifer voted for Mitt Romney. They all stood and held an uncompromising position. Get with our nerds. We need to find someone who doesn't compromise has never compromised, doesn't support stericycle, uh, doesn't support the rape exception, doesn't have plans to not do anything. We need to find, because they were a very loud, supportive group for the political party, um, for our political party, but every single pro-lifer converted to abolitionism and held their grounds. You know what it would have yielded? Obama would have been president, and the culture would have been like, there's no compromise with abortion. All these leaders, Catholics, Protestants, none of them are compromising with abortion. You would have had a movement, an uncompromising, we will not go with the multitude to do evil. The education of that alone to the GOP would have been fruitful. Now, what's that? Here's, the, here's, what yield, here's what was yielded by saying, by spending a lot of money going around and telling people to vote pro-life first. You educated the culture that there was a pro-lifer running. And there wasn't. But you taught the culture that because you printed off a lot of shirts that said it was a possibility. So you educated the culture that rape exceptions are pro-life. You educated the culture that if the GOP runs somebody who is less evil than the, the Democratic Party, they will be 
pro-life. You educated everyone, and Obama won. Um, what, what we're engaging in is actual moral suasion. People always say what needs to happen is the culture needs to change. Laws will not change until people change. We are trying to do the crazy radical thing of bringing, I mean, we're just focus, fo focusing on this one thing. I mean, there are other things about us that people don't like, but... Calling people to repent. Calling people to repent. Amen. My wife was reading Second Chronicles 2, uh, 29. Second Chronicles 29, and was it Hezekiah? What was the king? Yeah, it's like all through Chronicles and Kings and stuff, you have these like really wicked kings, but then you occasionally have one that discovers the law and is like, oh my gosh, and then they like immediately repent. Um, abolitionism's weird. It is um, rooted in, um, this is William Lloyd Garrison again, but he stole it from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. Um, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, um, correct oppression, uh, do mercy, love justice, put away evil, and then he says, though your, skins were, though your sins were scarlet, they will be whiter as snow. We are doing something foolish. A bunch of people telling the nation that it's full of blood and lust and evil and sin and that we will not compromise with it. We're just calling them to repent. We're calling the church apathetic. We're saying, wake up. We are just doing moral suasion and we are calling them and we are trying to change the culture. People say, well, that, how does that play out? Well, we're not opposed to personhood initiatives. We're not opposed to any of the other tactics that the, that the pro-life movement does or the pro-life lobby does or any of the laws that they're passing. We're just saying we're going to say this. And we're going to say it over and over and over and over and over again. And we're going to call anything that is sinful and destructive, sinful and destructive. We're going to say, wash yourselves, make yourself clean, correct oppression. Love justice, love mercy. That's what we're going to do. That's what abolitionists are going to do. That's all we're going to do. The reason, you say, well, but you also spend a lot of time uh, criticizing the pro-life movement. No, it's because we're doing that. The pro-life movement is full of sin. Abandoning people to destruction for political expedience is sin. Amen. So we're calling sin, sin. And it's just <laughs> foolish. And uh, the, 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 the weird thing is, and I don't want to give you like a really good answer, but um, the weird thing is, is that God uses the foolish things of the world to bring down the world. So, we look foolish. That's okay. Yeah. Um, we have a seven-stage strategy video on YouTube. It's very hard to watch because I'm a bad public speaker, but I suggest that um, you look at the stages. I believe the first thing is seeding the culture uh, with a symbol and an idea. The second thing is the flowering of societies doing assistance and agitation within local communities. Um, the third thing is dividing out from the culture, creating a culture of dissent so widespread in the country where you have abolitionists and anti-abolitionists, which is going to be a problem for everyone in the pro-choice movement. No one in America wants to be called an anti-abolitionist, but we're going to force them into that. Or if they don't like that, it'll be abolitionist first, abortionist. That's the third stage. All these stages, we're going to be calling the church to repent. I believe that if the church repents, we will see revival. If we have revival in a church that is not dead, we will have revolution. Stage five. And after we have revolution, we will have an actual divided people. Those who compromise with child killing, those who do not compromise with child killing, and when those who don't compromise with child killing decide to run a boycott, 55 million of them won't pay their income tax, and they will, can put Starbucks down or Planned Parenthood or Susan G. Komen because they're all seriously dead set on ending abortion. Right now, the way they end abortion is voting for people who think that Josie is 
worth killing. They're not giving up Starbucks because they support Planned Parenthood or something. They're not, they're, they're not changing, they're not modifying their lives. They're not dropping out of uh, biochem programs to sing crazy songs. At, uh, they're not dropping out of history of science programs. They're not modifying their lives. I think marches are fine. If you want to see what I said to marches, I think it's online. But there is a movement of people that's really small. Us. Calling sin, sin, and trying to create revival. Lord, I know you create revival. But we're trying to be the means and the mechanism and all that kind of stuff. There's this other movement that's supposed to be doing all these things, but it's filled with people who will say, rape and abortion are the wrong for the same reason, and then like three months later be like, but you know, I'm an abolitionist, so I won't throw my vote away. We are iconoclast. Every single golden calf of the pro-life movement that we think is sin will be called sin, and we will attack it, because if we can create uncompromising Christians who rise up, we can see the abolition of abortion. If we fail, at least we fail being obedient, and um, someone else will succeed after us. Sorry for the rant. It's, it's, not, I, it's not education. It's a call for repentance. You don't deal with sin by gathering more knowledge. You deal yeah. with sin by repentance. I don't think that is even recognizable by pro-lifers. That difference. Second Corinthians actually says some pro-lifers. Get up and answer that question. Maybe I should just turn my views yeah. around. That's like, you know, when somebody says, You're so foolish to vote, to tell people not to vote for Romney. Really? Should I have given Romney the gun and say, Go ahead and shoot me now? You're bragging so much about how you can go ahead and kill the rape issues. You know, that's a point of pat him on the back. Oh, I'm not extreme. He's bragging that he can kill my peers. And these people who are calling themselves pro life, not everybody. Should do if they're not that way. They ought to cry foul. 
be ashamed of the leaders in their movement. That's what they should do. I mean, the, the rub, here's the rub, Carol, and, and I understand, oh, I mean, you've done a lot of really good work, and you're a researcher, and, and, and I, like a, I like my Alpha 21 and all those things, um, and, and I recognize where you come from, so, so I understand you know these people, and we just pop up out of nowhere, and we're like, y'all suck. Uh, I mean, that's what it looks like, yeah, but... but Sure, sure, and, 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 and here's what I want to say. No, I, I understand what you're saying, and, and here's my plea. Let's, let's, let's not be afraid to hold them accountable. Then. That's what I'm saying. But here's the thing, Carol. If 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 they recognize what's wrong, they're like, I don't I don't want anything to do with it. Get me out. I, I'm done with that. Is what they'll say if they're like, that's wrong. I don't want anything to do with it. They repent and they go get it. I'm, they get away from it as much as they can. That's what they do. They don't go, man. My leaders, they're saying these things. I'm part of the rank and file and I disagree. But let's just all unify behind the word pro-life. If anything, they go, no, you, you're wrong. You don't represent us. But we don't see that. We see this almost blatant appeal to defending anybody who claims the name. And, and that's the problem. I, I'm perfectly fine with trying to reform the pro-life movement and trying to help them change and move. And in a lot of ways, we've helped them move. Not by being their friend, though. Sure. Sure. No, I absolutely agree. And Carol, and, and so, and so, this is the point. But the, we, we aren't trying to say something new. We're trying to hold on to something old and actually hold on to it. Yeah. That was the, kind of the point of the prior election. Like, the feeling I get is like, it's us and them. Mm-hmm. Well, Yeah. And of course, Toby Harmon.
Yeah, I don't need it. 